16 declares, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name forever and always. Our prayer tonight is that, God, you would receive our praise. Sing, y'all. Say it again. With thanksgiving. And we enter into your courts with praise. We will bless you. Yes, Lord. We lift you up. For you, O Lord. We magnify your holy name. Yes, God. We lift our hands to you this day. Receive our praise. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, but I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continuously be in my mouth. Yes. With our singing, we lift you up. Say it again. With thanksgiving. And we enter your courts with praise. We will bless you. With our singing, we lift you up. Come on, children. For you, O oh Lord. We magnify your holy name.
Well, good evening, everybody. Bishop A.J. Wright is here, and it's time for the encounter. Hey, y'all, what's going on? I hope you are excited about what the Lord shall do tonight. Y'all already know what I'm going to tell you. I've been saying it for so long, so come on, go with me. Come on, text somebody, call somebody, email somebody, send a picture to somebody, remind somebody that the encounter is on and we're on live and in living color with Bishop A.J. Wright. I'm so happy to be sharing with you on this last Tuesday in July. Wow. Y'all. Wow. Like, it's July 25th. It's the last Tuesday in July. Can we just talk about that for a moment? The last Tuesday, wow, man. Whoo, this year has just took off, flew by, my God. But we are here and we are alive. And to God be the glory for the great things he has done. So once again, I want to encourage you all to make sure you text somebody, call somebody, remind somebody, let them know that the encounter is on. As you all can tell, my voice is a little tired. <laughs> Excuse me. But I did preach twice Sunday and yeah, then had some stuff I had to do on yesterday. So yeah, vocally, I'm a little tired, but uh, yeah, by God's grace, I'm going to get me some rest this week and all of that good stuff. So I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Listen, let me just pause for a moment and say thank you to all of you who went with me on Tuesday evening, uh, Tuesday afternoon, I should say, uh, down to St. Paul. Amen. Oh, what, what did I say? I said Tuesday. Lord, thank you. See, thank God for a good producer. I meant Sunday, this past Sunday. That's what I was trying to say. This past Sunday, I want to say thank you to those of you who went with me to St. Paul to celebrate uh, Dr. Barr. Um, 16th pastoral anniversary. We had an incredible time in the Lord. I'm grateful to our worship team that came, band members that came, um, and portion or a small portion of our church who came. I want to say thank you. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to say thank you on Sunday, but thank you, thank you a thousand times over. The Lord blessed us and met us there. And of course, Sunday morning, we had a, a tremendous worship experience once again. Also want to let you all know that our worship leader, uh, Minister Janique Butler, her father was discharged yesterday. He went home yesterday. And so we give God praise. God still hears and answers prayers. I want us to be in prayer uh, for him, Mr. Walker. Uh, what an incredible guy. Let's be in prayer for him. There's so many others um, who are in need of prayer. Uh, Sister Curleen, I know you're watching, but we're praying for you. And just know that we got you covered and sealed in prayer. Amen. Mama Davis, amen. Well, we got you locked in prayer as well. And there's others who I may not know right off the top of my head, but God knows all of them. And listen, we've been covering you in prayer period. Anyhow, so just know you're loved, just know you're covered, just know your Manifest Church loves you, uh, Bishop and Lady Wright loves you, and uh, just know that God's going to be with you and all is well, in Jesus' name, amen? Amen. All right, y'all, listen, this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday, I need y'all to know, it's virtual only, it's virtual only, it's our fifth Sunday virtual experience, amen, so that means you spend time with the family at the house, but we need you to tune in, need you to tune in, as y'all can see, I'm quite sure you saw the, the uh, flyer at the bottom, and they can put that flyer up in front of me too, um, but listen, this Sunday, don't forget y'all, this Sunday, because you're going to show up here, and I'm trying to tell you, you ain't going to be able to get in the building, this Sunday is fifth Sunday, uh, virtual church only. Amen. So I want you to tune in. I want you to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, it's going to bless you in a tremendous way. Worship is going to be phenomenal. The word is going to be phenomenal. And then I want us to give phenomenally. Amen. I know you may not be in the sanctuary, but we still need you to make sure you give. Amen. Tithe. Amen. Just like you should be doing on Tuesday nights as well. Amen. I'm just saying, you know, hey, praise the Lord. But this coming Sunday, virtual service only. And so please, ma'am, please, sir, govern yourselves accordingly. To my Miami people, thank you all for being on tonight. I miss you guys so much. 
but I believe that God is about to give us a way of working out the situation with our air conditions and so we can get us back in our sanctuary down in Miami. Amen? Because we got to rebuild down there. We got to continue to build here in West Palm. Listen, God's got a great work for us to do, y'all. So please, man, please, sir, make sure you help us out in doing uh, your responsibilities and being a part of what God has called us to do. Amen? All right, I think I've covered everything I'm supposed to cover. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy towards others. We offer you praise. God, not for battles won and not for victories won, but God, just because you are God, we honor you. We just thank you and we bless you. I thank you for these who have tuned in, God. I thank you for these who are watching, God. I thank you for these who are connected, God. And I pray tonight, God, for a special anointing. I pray that, number one, you touch my voice, touch my vocal cords, God. I pray that you will strengthen them right now in the powerful name of Jesus. I pray for the hearts and the ears of every person who is watching and listening, God. I pray for their eyes to be able to see, God. I pray for their ears to be able to hear. I pray for their hearts to be able to uh, receive and their minds to conceive that which you have given us, God, to bring out in the in your word, God. Have your way tonight. Have your way in an incredible way. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. Move how you need to move, God. Father, we thank you for healing and wholeness and restoration on this side of Jordan for our, 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 our precious ones, God. We thank you for Brother Walker, God. Continue to touch him. We pray for Mama Davis, God. We pray that you would touch her, God, and we, we pray, God, God, for others I, I, whose names escape me, Sister Caroline, right now, we pray for her uh, wholeness on this side of glory. Oh, God, we pray right now that you will just touch right now in the powerful name of Jesus. Move by your spirit. Move by your might in the name of Jesus. Now, God, have your way in this teaching moment. Give me clarity of thought, mind, and speech. Fresh revelation knowledge, even now, God. Do it for your glory. Do it for your honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody love God. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen again. Once again, I want to take the time to welcome you to the encounter. Amen. Amen. I see Sister Thompson on and Sam is on and Lady Charlotte is on. Amen. And different ones are getting on. Amen. God bless you. Thank you all for connecting with us tonight. All right. Let's go to work. Let's go to work. Y'all. We're at the final teaching. We're at the final lesson. It's part two, but we're at the final lesson of uh, this book of Joshua. Yeah, man, we have been on this ride, uh, what, Tishon, since February, I think? Since February. So literally for like six months, we've been rolling out hard with Joshua. And I don't know about you all, this book has blessed my life i hope that it has blessed you like it's blessed me it's a it's an amazing book it's a great book of awareness it's a, a book that you really get to learn about god in an incredible way through these various situations that joshua and the children of israel had to go through but it's also it's a book about accountability yeah, man. And that's something that a lot of us lack right about now It's accountability. And so it's a great book. And I hope you've been blessed as we've been doing this series, the dawning of a brand new day, the dawning of a brand new era, the dawning of a brand new season, all of those things. That's been the overall series. But we've been walking through the book of Joshua. And on last week, we started with Joshua 23. And we're actually dealing with chapters 23 and 24 but we're going to go back to chapter 23 to kick off everything and i just want to do a brief summary of last week and then we're going to get right to where we need to be so joshua chapter 23 we're going to start at verse one amen we're going to start at verse one it says, now it came to pass a long time after the lord had given rest to israel from all their enemies around about them that Joshua was old and advancing in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for the elders and for the heads, for the judges and for their officers. And said to them, I am old and I'm advanced in age. You have seen all the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has 
fought for you. Lord have mercy. He gave you a sweatless victory. He fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand and to the left hand, and lest you go among these nations and these who remain among you. And the Lord add a blessing. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. All right. I want to jump right in. We are dealing with the final orders. And this is part two. Amen. We're dealing with the final orders. Uh, Y'all, last week we, we learned a few things, and I just want to kind of hit it real quick. That verse one sums up the context of this passage very well. Israel has acquired the land that God has promised them, and their faithful leader Joshua is now old and is preparing to die. Y'all, he's preparing to check out of there. Uh, we see that in verse 14. But before he steps off the scene, he's got something to say. He's got something to say to the people of Israel about serving God. And in order to communicate what's on his heart, he has two meetings. Uh, and, and the first meeting is in, it's found in chapter 23. The first meeting is found in chapter 23 that he held with the elders and the leaders. But in chapter 24, he deals with all of the people of Israel. And as Joshua, the old faithful soldier and general of Israel, prepares to break camp, he wants to encourage Israel to stay the course for God. Stay the course for God. Stay with God. He knows that the old guard um, that, that knew Moses and Joshua, they're, they're swiftly dying off. He knows that there's a new generation that is coming along that did not see all the miracles and all the wonders of the Lord in their midst. And so before he dies, he just wants to remind them of the God that they serve because he got a little concerned. And that's what I dealt with on last week. I talked about Joshua's concern. Y'all remember that? I talked about Joshua's concern. Uh, number one, he feared their complacency. He feared their complacency. Joshua is afraid that the people of Israel might begin to take the law of God for granted. He feels that they might become complacent in their walk with the Lord and begin to let things slide in their lives. And tragically, he was right, y'all. This is exactly what they did. And so he was concerned about it. He could see it coming. So he was concerned and, and he feared uh, their complacency. But not only did he fear their complacency, y'all, he feared their compromise. He felt like they were going to compromise the word of God. And I even dealt with that on last week. Like how many of us have gotten in a place where we have now compromised the word of the Lord? Did God really say that? It's almost like that thing that, that, the serpent said to Eve, like, did God really say you could eat that fruit? Did he really say that? And so we go to compromising things and we go to say, well, God didn't really say, he didn't really mean it that way. And y'all, we're guilty of some of the same stuff. Some of us have become complacent in our walk. Some of us have compromised our walk. But the other thing that Joshua feared, he feared their commitment. He feared their commitment. It is not that Joshua fears that they will be committed to the Lord. Rather, he fears that they might not cleave to God as they they should. And y'all, it's a that's a strong lesson for us. How many of us only see God for what we need him for? But outside of that need, there's no real commitment. All right. I know I'm talking good right there. We may not like it, but these were the concerns of Joshua. And just as they are the concerns of Joshua, and he's getting ready to check out of here. It's my concern as well. I'm looking at the church right now, and I'm not just talking about manifest. I'm looking at the universal church right now. And the church is in need. The church is in trouble. And I have great concerns, but that's what keeps me in prayer. That's what keeps me on my face before God, because I I see the church of the Lord Jesus Christ triumphant. I see the church of the Lord Jesus Christ amazing. But I do have concerns. I am concerned about our complacency. I am concerned about how we treat our, our Sunday morning worship experience. Oh, you know, well, I ain't got to do all of that. It don't take all of that. Yes, it does. It takes that and then so. With everything that's going on, Hey, y'all, if there was ever a time we needed to be committed in our walk, committed uh, to our church, committed to our Christ, Lord have mercy, 
It's now. And so we can't become complacent. We can't compromise it. And we must be committed. Everybody put that in. Say, I must be committed to God. See, here's the thing I've learned also. Let me say this. When people are committed to God, you won't have no problem with them being committed to the church. And so pastors who are watching me and, and leaders who are watching me, listen, if they won't be committed to God, you can you can hang it up. They sure ain't going to be committed to the church. And if they're committed to the church, trust me, they're, they're, there's not a commitment to God because then you wouldn't be looking for your name to be called. You wouldn't be looking for a particular position or title. You just want to be able to serve this present age to fulfill your calling. Talk A.J. Wright. But when people are committed only in flesh, yo, you're going to get fleshly things happening. But when they are committed to God, listen, you're going to get the spirit of God coming out of it. And they're going to be glad to serve. Hallelujah. They're going to serve the Lord with gladness. Why? Because there's a for real commitment to him. So, y'all, Joshua's concerned. He was concerned about their complacency. He was concerned about their compromise. And he was concerned about their commitment. All right, so let's move on to major point number two. And now I want to deal with Joshua's challenge. Joshua's challenge. All right. And, and we're still in chapter 23. And so in this session, in this section, I'm sorry, uh, Joshua challenges the elders and the people to observe certain truths concerning God. His challenge is for them to look at what the Lord has done and is doing in their lives. And if they would just consider the Lord, they, they will more than likely live the right kind of lives. All right. So he challenged them when you get when you get down to verses nine through 16, there is a challenge about the wrath of God. There's a challenge about the wrath of God. While there are many challenges given here, the primary idea that Joshua is trying to convey is this. If you will serve the Lord, watch this. If you will serve the Lord, he will bless you. This is something that Joshua is trying to push in his old age. He's trying to tell him. Now, listen, guys, if you serve the Lord, he's going to bless you. But if you disobey him, he's going to chastise you. And you know what the Bible teaches us, that God uh, chastens those whom he loves. Y'all, the challenge is in verse 11. And verse 11 is the crux of the matter. It's the crux of the matter. What are you saying, Bishop? Well, let's look at verse 11. Therefore, take care, uh, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. That's what he says in verse 11. He says, listen, take Take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Y'all, this is what the challenge is. How Israel responded to the Lord was a perfect indicator of her love for him. When they were obedient, that's what showed love to God. And so here it is. What you got to catch tonight is this. Watch this. That the challenge still applies to the people of God today. That that this this is very simple. It's very this ammunition is very simple. What is as a child of God, you have two possible ways of living your life. Either you can live it within the confines of God's will and be blessed, or you can live it outside of the will of God and be chastised. The choice is yours. The choice you make in life will be determined by your depth of love for Jesus Christ. What, what did Jesus tell us to do? That we're to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. That is, that's one of the greatest commandments. Yet there's the challenge there, you know, because we've allowed other things to get in the way of that. And can we be honest? All of us are guilty of it. All of us are guilty of it. Some of us, we don't love him like we used to. But see, here it is. <laughs> we'll come do this and we'll come do this. But when, when it's down to love, when it's real, when it's really down to real love for the Lord Jesus Christ, there's some things we kind of challenge with. And, and it, what it reminded me of, what it reminded me of was the, the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus uh, in, in Revelations 2, verses 1 through 7, the church at Ephesus, they, they had commendable traits. Y'all, they were doing great things in the community. Watch this. They were doing great things in the community. They were helping the city. They were helping people. They were doing outreach. They was doing all of these things, but they lack deep abiding love for Jesus. He says, I got one thing, for, I got one thing against you. Y'all doing some great stuff. 
But I got, I, I got, I got one thing against y'all. What is it, Jesus? You've left your first love. Man, if your heart isn't in it, if your heart isn't in it, it will show y'all, y'all, <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> what can we say about this? <laughs> there was a song, I had to think think it through. There was a song I remember hearing as a, as, as a little boy. I want to live so God can use me anytime and anywhere. I want to live so. My life ought to be a reflection of love. That I love God so much that he says, man, I'm going to use her here and I'm going to use him there and I'm going to put them in this space in, in the marketplace and I'm going to put this one over here in the marketplace and I'm because their love for me is so amazing. And can I tell you, sometimes your love for God will put you in places that you don't even qualify for. I just said so powerful. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't feeling me right there. Your love for God will sometimes put you in rooms that you're not even ready for, but God will make sure he words your mouth to be able to say what you need to say in that moment. But it's all about your love for God. So he challenges them about the wrath of God because here's the deal. I just dealt with the love of God, but can we deal with the other side? He says, now, if y'all don't obey, God's going to chase in you. God's going to chastise you. God's going to come after you. Notice the word. He says God will chase you. Chasing doesn't mean punish. I want to say that again. Chasing does not mean punish. But he is going to deal with you in a major way that you ain't going to want to. Listen, I done been chastised by the Lord. And yeah, I ain't trying to do that no more. I'm just saying. You know, God has a way of dealing with us and meeting us right where we are and helping us to understand that there are consequences and repercussions to our actions and to our decisions. Can we be honest about that? So there's a challenge about the wrath of God. But then, ladies and gentlemen, if you keep reading, now we're into chapter 24. Let's come on over to chapter 24, right? When you read verses 1 through 13, there's a challenge about the works of God. There's a challenge about the works of God. Joshua reminds the nation of all of the many great things the Lord has done for them. He ch his challenge is for them to remember all the works of the Lord on their behalf. Did y'all hear what I said? His challenge for them is that they will remember all the works of the Lord on their behalf. If they will remember his goodness and of his mercy, they will be more likely to serve him faithfully, y'all. And what you got to understand is the mighty works of God on our behalf should motivate us for great service. When you think about how he died on the cross, when you think about how he loved us when we were lost, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you think about how, how he came to us for our sins, how he called us unto himself. When you think about how he saved us from our sins when we asked him to. When you think about the fact that he forgave us of all of our sins and failures. When you think about the fact that he adopted us into his royal family. When you think about the fact that he has a promise of, of heaven for us. When you think about that he has promised to meet all of our needs and bless our lives. When you think about that he promises never to leave us nor forsake us, that ought to make you shout. That ought to make you holler. That ought to make you scream, but that ought to make you love him even that much more. Consider all that God has done for you. When was the last time you just told him, God, I don't only want to praise you with my lips. I want to serve you with my life. Because when I can, we go old school, Think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. It's not only I thank God for saving me, but my soul cries out, hallelujah, because I understand where I was to where I am now. And so my soul cries out, hallelujah. But watch this. My works cry out, hallelujah. Are y'all catching this? My works cry out. The, may the work I've done speak for me? Yes, indeed. I wanted to show how much I love God and how much I am committed to God. So he, he has a challenge uh, about the works of God. But then he also gives them a challenge as we move on to verses 18, uh, 14 through 18, chapter 24. There's a challenge about the will of God. 
Everybody say God's will is what I want, right? All right. There's a challenge about the will of God. Joshua tells the people that it is the Lord's will for them to clean up their act, clean up their lives, and serve the Lord faithfully. All right. Are y'all y'all still with me? Y'all still hanging out with me? He says, now, y'all, 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 y'all gonna have to do something now. Y'all, y'all gonna have to clean up your act. Uh-oh. I got to get to some good stuff here. He says, now y'all, y'all, y'all are gonna have to clean up your act. Clean up, clean up, everybody clean up. Why am I singing that song? But listen, he says, now he makes this statement. He says something in verse 15 that in fact, let me read verse 15. Let's let, let, let me now you let me let me just go to the scripture. He says something. Now, this is the challenge about the will of God. Watch this, y'all. Watch this. You ready? Verse 15 says these words. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But look at his assertive answer. As for me and my house, we's going to serve the Lord. Y'all can do what y'all want to. And I'm about to check out of here, but my house, no. Not only as for me, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Y'all, and I just want to challenge you today by reminding you that, that just talking about serving God is not just good preaching material or teaching material. It is the will of God for our lives. It's not just something we say. It's something that we ought to want to do. Why? Because he wants you to search your life and destroy anything that hinders your walk with him. He wants you to be clean and to make that commitment to serve him and him alone. Joshua says, look, if, 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 if it seems evil to you, for you to serve God, do what you will. You want to serve the God of where we are now? You go ahead on. You want to serve the God on the other side? You go ahead on. But look, we're going to stick with what we know works. We're going to stick with who we know works well. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just notice Joshua's attitude towards the situation. He tells them what he expects the nation of Israel to do, but then he tells them that regardless of what they're going to do, whatever they choose to do, I'm going to serve the Lord. Who got that song? Uh, was it Timothy, right? Say, for the rest of my life, I'll serve the Lord. And the drive of the song is, I'll serve the Lord. Now, first of all, that's just good good church music just some good church music but when 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 i think about that song like even me just saying i'm going to serve the lord in my mind even now i'm saying how can i serve him better cuz i serve him already i i serve him i give him what is rightfully due him but i'm constantly i'm i'm constantly thinking about how can i serve the lord better how can i serve the lord with gladness because there's been sometimes I wasn't serving him with gladness. There's been sometimes I was serving him mad. Oh, come on. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. Uh, I was mad. I was there, but I wasn't serving him with gladness. But there, even as I'm saying those, those, those words, for the rest of my life, I'll serve the Lord. There are days when I have to serve him with tears in my eyes. There are days that I have to serve him with pain in my chest. There's days when I have to serve him that I don't understand, but it's in, it's in my servitude to him that he'll send me the answer, that he'll send me the breakthrough. And it don't may, it may not come right when I want it. Because sometimes I got to be okay with the moment of serving in pain. But after I have suffered a while, he will establish me. He will sustain me. He will maintain me. And not only will he do that, he will propel me. He'll take me to my next level. And so the reality of it is sometimes God's just trying to see how much you really love him. Uh-oh, y'all got quiet. Okay, I know. Sometimes God just wants to see if, 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 if I allow this affliction to happen, will you still serve me? Will you still honor me? 
Will you still if it if you don't get the job that you want, thought you were gonna get, if you don't get the position that you thought you was gonna get, will you still serve me? Will you still honor me? If if the money didn't come in the way you thought it was gonna come, are you gonna turn your back on me or are you still gonna serve me? Can I can I talk to somebody? Because Joshua says, Look, now I know y'all didn't see all the miracles that we saw, and so I know y'all, y'all a new school, y'all a new crew, but I want to remind you. We serve Jehovah God over here. And listen, y'all do what y'all want to do. But as for me and my house, listen, listen to the conviction there. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord because we know what he's done for us. We know what he's brought us through. And guess what? We keep telling generations after generation after generation because we want everybody within our generation to know what god did y'all hear what i'm saying so not only uh is there a challenge about the will and there's a challenge about the works of god and there's a challenge about the wrath of god but then i found something else in verses 19 through 24 of chapter 24 that joshua wants them to consider god's witness he wants them to consider God's witness. Joshua makes a strange statement to the people. Bishop, where are you? He makes a strange statement to the people. He tells them, in fact, this is in verse 19, verse 19 of chapter 24. He tells them that they cannot serve the Lord. What? He said they cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God and he is a jealous God and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. His meaning is clear. He is reminding them that the Lord witnesses their lives and they cannot have things both ways. He sees what they are doing. They openly say, God, we love you, but probably they're doing something else. Uh-oh, I'm about to get in some trouble. He says, you can't serve the Lord on one hand and then on the other hand serve false gods. Uh-oh, you can't serve the Lord on one hand and on the other hand you're worshiping crystals. Can't serve the Lord on one hand and talk about I'm praying to the universe. Did the you? I got a question for you. Uh-oh, Tashana, y'all better pray for me because I'm out here. Did the universe make it, makes itself? Did it make itself? So why are you praying to the universe when the universe didn't make itself? The, the Bible says in Genesis 1, in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning, God, not universe, God created the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth. The universe is part of the heavenly body. He created the heavens and the earth. It was without form and void. God is responsible. You talk about, oh, I pray to the universe and the universe brought me this. Boo! Check this out. Why are you praying to creation? instead of praying to the creator of creation. It is God who is responsible for this. And so he says, listen, now y'all going to serve God. Y'all got to serve God, but you can't have it both ways. You can't be saying I serve God, but then I, I, I worship Crystal. I serve God, but I, I'm serving, I, 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 you know, I pray to the universe. I'm serving God or I'm burning sage or I'm serving God. And I'm doing all these other things that are contrary to the word of God. He lets them know you can't have it both ways. His reminder is that judgment will accompany such actions. And again, the people say, listen, we hear you, old man. We receive it, old man. We may not like it, old man, but we going with you, old man, and we are going to serve the Lord. We are going to go after God. Our desire is to follow Christ. And I want to remind you, that the Lord is also watching your life and my life today. You can't have things both ways. Either you're serving the Lord with absolute commitment or you're living a life of hypocrisy. That's real talk. That's real talk. See, I told you this book brings about accountability. 
So there's Joshua's concern. There's Joshua's challenge. But then finally, ladies and gentlemen, I know some of y'all are saying, ooh, this is a hard word. No, it's not a hard word when you're already doing it. It's not a hard word. It's just a word that brings accountability and it's a word that is reminding us. All right? So finally, let's talk about Joshua's covenant. Let's talk about Joshua's covenant. All right, we're down in chapter 24 now. We're dealing with verses 25 through 33. As his last official act as the leader of Israel, Joshua leads them in a renewal of their covenant with God. This ritual, it involves several stones. And I want to I want us to take a brief look at these stones. Number one, it involved a great stone. It involved a great stone. Verses 25 through 28. Text is tailored to teachers that before Joshua dies, he erects, watch this, a great stone as a monument to the fact that the people have sworn to follow God. He erects a great monument to the fact that the people have sworn to follow God. Thereafter, whenever they pass by that place, they will remember their hope and be certain that their lives were pleasing to God. Whenever they pass by that particular stone, that was the stone that reminded them of their commitment to God. Now, y'all, here's the deal. We do not erect stone markers to memorialize our oath to God. But still, we should remember them, don't, don't we? Should we? Or should I say shouldn't we? We still should remember them. Do you remember? I almost said, do you remember when we fell in love? Never mind. But no, do y'all remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you promised God you'll serve him faithfully? I got one for you. Do you remember when you got yourself in some, some shenanigans and you say, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Jesus, y'all remember that? <laughs> or here's the question. Have you forgotten your promise? Have you forgotten the vow that you made to God? Because trust me, God has it forgotten. I want to read this verse to you. Tashada, just type this in. It's Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 5. In fact, we're going to abbreviate Ecclesiastes. E-C-C-L, period. E-C-C-L, right? Five, Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Look what the word says for some of y'all who done forgot. You know, do you remember the time? Yeah, I'm talking about y'all. Y'all, yeah, you, 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 you. Look what the word tells us. Because, see, you made that promise. God didn't forget. You forgot it, but God didn't forget. Look what the word says. It is far better to never make a promise to God than it is to make it and then break it. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than that to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thy heart be hasty. See, I had to read this from the King James Version. Let, thy, let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven. And thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be you for a dream coming through the multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. When thou vowest a vow, when thou make a vow, all right, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he have no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou should not vow then that thou should vow and not pay it. It got real quiet in virtual land. It's quiet. Hey, come back. Come back. I'm just telling you what the word says. 
All I'm saying, y'all, is this question right here. Are you doing all the things that you told God you were going to do? And if, you, if you're not, today would be a good day to make it right with him. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, y'all, it involved a great stone. I know y'all ain't liking me right now, but I promise you, some stuff we just, this is, I got it, Tashana. This is a word, what we would call a tune-up. This is a tune-up. Okay, you know, right about now, we need to make sure our cars are tuned up. We need to make sure everything is running. All the spark plugs are right. Oil is changed out. Uh, transmission fuel is changed out. That's just, that's what kind of word this is. This is a tune-up, right? All right. So huh, I just talked about it. It, it involved uh, a great stone, but here's, here's the next one. It involved some grave stones. It involved some grave stones. In this part of the final part of this chapter, it closes with three funerals. How many? Three. And these funerals should speak to us right now. Number one, there's the gravestone of faithfulness. There's the gravestone of faithfulness. Verses 29 through 31 shows us that the first stone was, was mentioned, or that is mentioned, is that of Joshua himself. This is a great gravestone of faithfulness. It's mentioned because it deals with Joshua himself. His tombstone spoke about the faithfulness of God to his people. This is the grave of faithfulness. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Ooh, this is the grave of faithfulness. God has used this man, Joshua, to bring the people of Israel into the promised land. And God has used Joshua to lead these people in the right way. So through the life of Joshua, God had proven himself to be a faithful God. <sighs> Y'all know I'm about, I, I feel myself about to hit 2 Thessalonians 3. It's about to come out in God, but God is faithful. It look, Joshua says, Look, I gotta this tombstone speaks of the faithfulness of God. It's a gravestone of faithfulness. It's verses 29 through 31. But here's the second gravestone. Boy, I got so much more I could really say right there. Morning by morning, brand new mercies we experience because of the faithfulness of God. Like, really, y'all? Like. When you check out of here, could your tombstone read? This is a gravestone of faithfulness. Could your tombstone read that? Could could the could the inscription on the mausoleum read that this is the 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 tombstone of faithfulness? Y'all, the second one, the second one was the gravestone of fulfillment. We're in verse thirty-two now. I'm wrapping this up. The gravestone of fulfillment. The second gravestone mentioned belonged to a man who had died many centuries before in the land of Egypt. You're going to love this one, Elder Tashana. Watch this. It, it, it was for a man who died many, many centuries ago before in the land of Israel. Or in the land of Egypt, I, I'd say Israel, but it's actually Egypt. This is the gravestone of fulfillment, the grave of fulfillment. Watch this. I did my homework. While Joseph was on his deathbed, he made the following prediction. Here's what it says in Genesis 50, verses 24 through 26. Genesis 50, verses 24 through 25. Through 24 through 26. Look what it says. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and ye shall carry up my bones from hence, Lord Jesus, I'm about to shout. So Joseph died 
being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. But Joseph gave a report that was supposed to happen. But they buried him in Egypt. Now, several hundred years later, look what happens. A grave is dug, a coffin is lowered, and a body is placed in the ground that was promised hundreds of years before. Y'all, I can almost imagine that if you listen very carefully to the grave of Joseph after he was buried there, you might have heard these words right here. See, I told you so. See, I told you so. Y'all thought I was going to be buried in Egypt, and yeah, I was there for a little while, but I know what God told me, and now look where I am. Look where I am now. His bones were taken to the very place that he prophesied that he would go. Y'all, here's the lesson, that when we serve a God who is able to make that which seems impossible our reality, you wouldn't want to serve another God. God had already told him. He had already told him, listen, yeah, I know y'all burying me here, but no, 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 no. This ain't where I'm going. This ain't my eternal home. This ain't my eternal resting place. That's what I want to say. This ain't my eternal resting place. No, my bones got to be taken to another place. <laughs> Why? Because it's the fulfillment of God's promise to me. And there are some things, can I say this to you by the power of the Holy Ghost? Thank you, Jesus. There are some things that you may not see in this lifetime, but God still is going to make it happen because it's a fulfillment of a promise that is being made to you. In fact, let me really go here. Some of y'all are living in that fulfillment right now because God promised your mama, God promised your grandmama, God promised your great-great-grandmama or great-great-grandfather that he was going to do certain things because of their faithfulness. And you are living in what he promised them. And so it is a fulfillment of what he said that he would do. See, God blesses from generation to generation to generation. And so sometimes you may not experience it and stop being so selfish thinking that it's all for you. Some of this stuff is for your children's children. But baby, you better believe me. They can't die until they see the fulfillment of what God told you was going to happen. Lord have mercy. <laughs> they can't die. They can't die. They, somebody's going to experience the fulfillment of what he promised you. Lord, ooh, it's so much right there. Uh, somebody's going to get, and you're already living in a place of fulfillment. There is a gifting and an anointing that's on your life right now because it's the fulfillment of what your grandmother prayed. It's the fulfillment of what your grandfather prayed. It's the fulfillment of what your uncle and your aunt prayed, what your godmama prayed for. You're living it out. You're walking in it. You're breathing in it. You're talking it through. You're preaching it. I'm trying to tell you, I am one of those things. I am one of those purpose, persons. Uh, I'm the fulfillment of Risa and O.G. Gilbert. I'm the fulfillment of what they prayed. And what God told them would happen with me. I'm the fulfillment of what God said would come to pass. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you. Oh, Lord. I, I got caught up. Lord, there's the gravestone of faithfulness, <laughs> the gravestone of fulfillment. But then finally, <laughs> now unto Lord, I can't let it long. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all. You can ask or think. It's according to the power. That, now unto him who's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all, above all. Whatever you've asked, he's able to supersede all of that that you can think of. Now unto him. Oh, God help me. Now I can't let it alone. You look. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God told me, he just he just stopped me right now. There are some promises that have been made to you over this last decade. God says you won't die until you see it. And some of y'all ought to get 
you ought to get real excited because you know there's some things that should have disqualified you a long time ago. But God made a promise to you and he's made a promise to your parents and your grandparents that you will not die until you see the fulfillment of that which you prayed for, of that which you asked him for. And I've come to tell you it's going to blow your mind. It's going to supersede any and everything you could have ever asked for or dreamed of. It's the gravestone of fulfillment, the gravestone of faithfulness, but then finally, the gravestone of finality. The gravestone of finality. Lord, I'm way over my time. The last gravestone, verse 33. The last gravestone marks the grave of Eleazar. Did I say it right? Yeah, I said it right. Eleazar. He was the son of Aaron, the first high priest. His grave is the grave of finality. The death of Eleazar marks the changing of the guard in Israel. A.J. Wright, you teach him better than they hollering at you. He is, he marks the representation of the changing of the guard in Israel. You see, now all the old timers are gone, y'all. And all those who came out of Egypt, and out of the wilderness have now passed from the scene. All those now, all those now who God used in such a mighty way, in such a mighty fashion, they all gone on to glory. Now it is time for a new generation to pick up the mantle of service and do something for God. Can I say this? It's sad. And I would even dare to say it's a shame when the old soldiers of the kingdom pass from the scene. Because y'all, their presence and their gifts are still missed by the church. It's, it's sad. I, I think about some of the precious souls who've served here. I miss them. I miss them. God knows I miss them. And I don't want to get into calling names because then I'm going to really go to thinking about it and it's going to bring tears to my eyes, and it's going to make me get sad. But it's sad when they, when they leave us. I know heaven rejoices, and I know we should be rejoicing, but can we be honest? We miss them. We miss them. We want them to be with Jesus, but sometimes we miss them. Can we just be honest, y'all? But it's a sad thing because their presence and their gifts are still missed by the church. But what's a greater shame? This is the, that's the sad part. It's not a shameful part, but it's the sad part. But what's the shame is this. When those who are left behind, who do not lift the mantle to carry on. Where are the, oh, I'm finna. Where are my Elishas? Who would say, God, if you did it for Elijah, then do it for me. Where are my new Elishas? Where are my new Joshuas? Because a lot of the old guard, they're checking out of here. So many precious souls, they've been checking out. They've been, they've been checking out. And I'm looking at new school, and I'm, I'm nervous. Because it seems like new school and this modern-day church They've laid some stuff down. They've compromised some stuff that the old saints wouldn't have stood for. And I'm not talking about old saints who were ignorant of the word of God. I'm talking about old saints who knew how to rightly divide the word of truth. And old saints would have checked you and called you out on it and said, hey, uh-uh, we don't do that. No, 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 no. Let's fix that. Where are our new Elijahs or Elishas who was like, who would be like, the same God of Elijah, I need you to come work for me now. Because if you did it for Elijah, I need you to do it for me. If you did it for Joshua, if you did it for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I need that God. Because I'm telling you, y'all, if we would get to that place and we would get to, if we had people who would really stand up for Jesus, man, I, I, really, I really believe this whole world would be in a better place. Where is where is the church? I'm going to get in trouble right here. Where is the church? Where is the church? This is how we're closing out this book. 
Where is the church who will really stand for Jesus? Not for politics, but for Jesus. See, the way we're treating our elderly, the way we're treating babies, yeah, you're for you're not pro-life, you're pro-abortion. Because if you were pro-life, if you were really pro-life, you would be concerned about the womb to the tomb and not just the womb. Where are those who are concerned about the el elderly? Where are those who are concerned about the widows and the orphans? Where are those who are concerned about the, the adopted ones? Where are, the, where, where are those who are, who are concerned about making sure everybody has rights? Oh, my God. Where are those? Where are the people who will, who will cry aloud and spare not? Where are those people who would who would who would check folk who said a, a crazy statement like this that slavery benefited black people? Where are those who would check it and say, no, 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 let's straighten that out. Let's fix that. Because slavery did not benefit us. How did it benefit us? Well, you learned uh, tools and you learned trades and stuff. No, 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 no. Then who taught it to us? Guess what? When we were in our country, we were already doing this stuff. You came and robbed us from our land and brought us over here. You didn't teach us nothing. We came with those skills. God gave us that. So we didn't benefit from slavery. Don't do that. But where are those who will check that? Where are my Elishas? Where are my Joshua's? Can I make it? Can I bring it on in? Where are my, where's my new Martin Luther King Jr.? Where's my new Malcolm X? Where's the new Jesse Jackson? Where's the new Al Sharpton? Because many of us, we talk in our homes, but are we saying anything outside? Where are the people who will stand up for Jesus? Where are those who will say, hey, we got to make sure we feed the homeless, clothe the naked? He says, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Hey, y'all. See, this book is more than just about hikamasandas and, and quickening. No, 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 no. There's a practicality to this text. Joshua's got concerns. He, he puts challenges out there. Hey, we're going to serve God. How do we serve God? We serve God by serving our fellow man. Hey, Jay Wright, you talking good. Yeah, I know I'm taking a little longer tonight. Hey, man, we got so much to, to do. And I'm telling you, God has given us the land. But when we get the land, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to gloat about it? Because I think that's what happened. We were gloating, and then we let the enemy in. We were so busy partying. My generation was so busy partying. We let the enemy in, and now look where we are now. Now our children are going to have to pay a price for stuff that we did not do. We used to sing the song, We Shall Overcome, not realizing that every generation has to overcome something. And so my generation now comes up on the scene and I know y'all gonna get mad with me, but we, we done came up on the scene. We were so busy having a good time that we didn't realize we needed to continue to fight and stand up for the rights of people across the board. Not only for ourselves as black people, but for people across the board, for women, for children, for the elderly, for everybody, for mankind. Why is there more laws concerning animals than they are for us i'm talking real good tonight listen ladies and gentlemen god has given us land god has given us blessings but there is a challenge to the church we can't be complacent we can't compromise the word of god and we got to tighten up on our commitment god is saying choose ye this day whom you gonna serve is it gonna be god or is it gonna be man and then Joshua makes the emphatic decision of saying, listen, y'all can do what y'all want to do. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Don't let the dawning of this brand new day go into the trash. Let's serve God. Let's let God know how much we appreciate him for the gifts that he's given us, for the blessings that he's given us. But let's learn how to also understand that there are some responsibilities 
God has given us. We got to take back the land. The earth is groaning. Can't y'all feel it? The heat outside, the tornadoes. Better get ready for hurricanes. Because this, all this heat, yeah. It's moaning and groaning. Why is it moaning and groaning, Bishop? I'm glad you asked. Because it's moaning and groaning because it's waiting on the sons of God to manifest. To come forth. To stand up. To cry aloud and spare not. My prayer in teaching this book to you is that it would cause you to say, let me spend some time in strengthening my relationship with God. Not just for what he can do for me, but what I ought to be willing to do for him. Amen. Father, seal this word in our hearts that we'll be the better for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. I'm done, y'all. I'm done. I pray that the word has blessed you. I pray that the word has been beneficial. It's a word of accountability. It's a word to remind us to tighten it up, to get it together. Amen. It's offering time, y'all. It's offering time. It's offering time. Lord, I'm checking on here. I'm checking on here just to see who all I got because I know it got a little tight there. I know it got a little rough there because we don't like to be told what to do. We don't like, oh, Bishop, I, mm, I don't need to hear that. And I probably lost people halfway through. It's okay. I can, won't be unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Won't be unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Won't be unto me if I don't preach the full account of God's word. I got to do it. It's offering time, y'all. It's offering time. Come on, let's give. Let's give. I ain't giving nothing. You, the devil is a lie. Come on, let's give. So something. So something. It's tight, but it's right. I know. Come on. It's all right. This is a word to make us think. It's had me thinking all day. What shall I render unto God for all his blessings? What shall I render? What shall I give? God has everything. Everything belongs to him. Why am I thinking of all these old songs and now it's making sense to me? I used to play all of this stuff for churches and stuff. What shall I render unto God for all of his blessings, for all of his benefits? Man, listen. He's been faithful, man. He's been faithful. I owe him. I owe him my life. I owe him my praise. I owe him my service for all of my days. I owe him all, y'all. That's why I got to serve him. That's why I got to bless him. That's why I got to honor him. Come on, let's, let's give. Let's give. Let's give. Let's give. Come on, let's give. Let's give. Listen, I love you with the love of the Lord. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Don't forget this coming Sunday. This coming Sunday, we are virtual only, virtual only. We're virtual only. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a great time in God. And uh, you, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. 1045, tune right on in. Be a part of the worship experience. Let's make sure we give. Amen. If it's your turn to tithe, then come on, let's tithe. Let's give. Let's do what we got to do. Amen. Come on, saints. Let's do what we got to do. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Listen, by the way. We're going to take off a month from Bible study. We're going to take off a month from Bible study. We're going to play some old ones, amen, over these next four weeks. But we're going to take off because we know a lot of you all are trying to get your, your final vacations in and you're trying to get the kids ready for school. So we're going to we're going to take off from doing live Bible study. We'll, we will replace some of the ones from this Joshua series. Uh, but we're going to take off. Uh, for the month of August is also our prayer month. Amen. It's our prayer month. And so we want you to know that we'll be sharing with you come the first Sunday of August of when we will, when we will start, I'm sorry, when we will begin our early morning prayer time. We'll let you know all of those things. But listen, this was the last one for right now. All right. I hope you were blessed. Know that I love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. All right. Until the next time, be blessed in Jesus name. Bye.